Hello and welcome. Hello, hello. Waiting for people to show up. Thank you for joining us. Happy Juneteenth. Welcome to Twaloha at Home. Glad to be back with you. My name is Jamie Torkowski, and I am the founder of To Write Love on Her Arms, speaking to you on behalf of our team. Uh, I'm gonna do one quick thing. I'm gonna turn off the comments. That's something we've been doing for the last few weeks as we want to listen, especially to black voices. And we're excited to have uh, a great friend of mine and one of my favorite black voices on today, the artist Propaganda. And our second guest who will actually be joining us first is a licensed mental health counselor by the name of Stefan Montessarin. Stefan is based in Orlando. He's a To Write Love on Our Arms board member. Prop will be joining us from Los Angeles. Excited to talk to both of these guys today, but we've been turning the comments off just as a way to honor our guests and a way to really practice listening. Uh, we've been saying as an organization for the last couple of weeks uh, that we believe Black Lives Matter. And with that, we believe that Black mental health matters too. A couple of weeks ago, we shared an extensive list of mental health resources created by and for Black people. And so we've been proud to be able to offer that. If you are an African-American and you are interested in getting help and maybe you're having trouble, maybe there's a, a financial boundary or some confusion over, over where to go, where to turn, you can email us at findhelp@twaloha.com. So again, findhelp@twaloha.com. Uh, a couple days after we posted that list, we posted another extensive list for white people who want to learn, who want to learn about and practice anti-racism. So two great resources that we shared a couple weeks back, and there are some other new blogs that have gone up on the site that we would love for you to look at. Again, our website is twloha.com. And with that, I'm going to bring on our first guest, Stefan Montessarin, hoping he's available. I know, like I said, he's a counselor and I know he just finished up a session. Let's see. Stefan, if you are on, please ask to join. Jess, if you want to text Stefan. Let's see. Stefan, are you here, my man? He's a, he's a real counselor, so he just finished up helping someone. Uh, but hopefully he'll be with us any second. Let's see. Stefan, are you out there, my man? Let's see. I'm gonna try to find him. Sorry, you guys. Oh, there he is. Okay. Gracie, my dog is sitting next to me. She's being good. You might hear from her later. Hey, buddy. Hey. Hi. How's it I going? I thought I was gonna have to just just cover for you. Just talk <laughs> about whatever I could for for thirty minutes. I was hearing you and having some technical issues. It's not uncommon. It's okay, man. <laughs> I told you're a counselor. You were counseling. I was counseling. Yeah, <laughs> counseling myself. How are you doing, man? Sure. Thanks for. Thank you for making time. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. It's always a pleasure, man. It's good to see you. We had you on a few weeks back, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I get, uh, well, who knows now? It's a pandemic, so. <laughs> I know. It could have been. I wonder. Maybe personally and professionally, if you could just kind of share what the last few weeks have been like for you. Yeah, I think it's still, um, it's coming down off the level of disorientation that I think I felt at the beginning. Um, there was a sense of that, that personal and that collective huge transition that we all had to make. And that I experienced yeah. that as just, I, I don't think unlike anybody else, so much uncertainty, so much kind of forced change. Uh, and then a little bit of that fear, like what, is, what does this coronavirus mean? 
how our world's going to be affected, our families, our finances. And then that shows up right in our, in our mental and emotional health. And so I think we all had to make huge strides in a very short time to better understand what was going on. Um, mm. I think professionally, I had to draw some pretty heavy boundaries for myself about how I was going to deal with my personal issues, right? Getting support, dealing with my own mental, emotional health, talking to my counselor, and then also professionally, how I'm going to help other people through. So in a sense, it kind of keeps you honest. I'm having to continue to grow and to pay attention to my experience so that I can be helpful for others. Hmm. What about how, how does the, the murder of George Floyd um, and what we've seen, just the incredible yeah. momentum, the incredible response, the protests, I wonder how has that, how has that factored into your last few weeks? I think in a big way, man. I th I'm, I'm a person of color. Um, I've had my own journey with understanding and contending with, with uh, race and ethnicity and injustice and white supremacy. Um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in the South. I'm, I was born in Puerto Rico and grew up in like the predominantly um, white, black South. And so there were very few categories where I felt like I, I fit in. And I think a lot of my journey was understanding my relationship to my color, my relationship to conversations around race that weren't at the time explicit because it was the 80s and 90s and a lot of the commentary was we're post-racial now. But I mm -hmm. felt something. There was something happening inside of me, this really um, implicit experience that was hard to navigate, that was confusing. And... And then you, you deal with anti-blackness as well. And so anything that relates to blackness is, is more looked down upon. And so even inside of me, I was conscious of that reality, that racist reality. And so I benefited from construct of race that put me outside of blackness. I was other, but I wasn't sure. black. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I think we're seeing this, this another watershed moments. There have been plenty over the years that have been um, helpful to bring these issues up, but haven't changed so much societally. Mm -hmm. And so holding intention and carrying the, the grief of what happened in this individual instance, right? Like he be, George Floyd becomes this, this symbol and it took him dying for us to see it, the symbol of like systemic oppression. Like the, lee, the knee was literally on his neck and at the same time, like wondering what will change, wondering how this will affect society moving forward. You see this grand gesture all over the world, right? The protests and it's empowering to a great degree. I'm wondering how that's going to affect our political systems, affect how many people vote, affect sure. how long this lasts. Like it's not, it's not over yet. And so I'm, I'm curious about that personally. I'm seeing it in my clients and conversations about like my white clients, like, what do we do? How do we respond? How, how can we help? I, I, I have this inside of me and I don't know what to do with it. And then in my person, persons of color and in my black clients, it's a completely different conversation of just frustration that's been there a long time. Hmm. I wonder to whatever extent you're comfortable you could talk a little more about that because you are a licensed mental health counselor mm -hmm. having these conversations with your clients. Um, I wonder, has anything surprised you or have there been some common threads throughout those, uh, those sessions? Um, let, me th let me see. I think as, as conversations about race become a little bit clear, like what, what, what the terms mean. So when we talk about racism, well, I'm not racist. And so I think that's been a theme that's come up a lot and giving people context for what that could possibly mean and defining it like on a systemic level and then how that shows up on a personal level or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, words like white privilege or white supremacy or, the general confusion about how I as an individual participate in the mm -hmm. systems around me and then how that affects my well-being, right? 
like whether I'm a person of color, um, black or indigenous or white, I'm affected by the system around me in, in negative ways, even if I don't perceive it. And that's going to affect my, my mental emotional health. I can't, I can't be free, I can't be liberated in the culture did I cut out? No, my screen time popped up. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's my boundaries getting in the way. Right. <laughs> you didn't want to hear it. You shut it down. <laughs> no, no. Um, if, if I'm, if I'm part of a system that I understand and I don't really get how I'm affected by it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be unaffected by it. Hmm. And so the more I understand what's happening and how I relate to my culture at large, the more chance I have to get healthy and to see other people get healthy. And I think on a, on a systemic and like racist system, we have to address that through a lens of mental health as well. Do your clients seem more open to the conversation? Like, do you feel like people are processing with you and they're open to learning and growing maybe more than ever? That's my hope. I think a lot of them are. And then we, we, we have people in different levels of understanding and different levels of um, availability just based on where they are. And I think that's one of the cool things that's come out of this particular um, chapter of, of the movement of this like anti-racist or in, injustice movement is um, giving people permission to enter at the level at which they can. Maybe you're not on the front lines. Maybe you're not leading the protests and like picking up tear gas ganisters and, and you know, confronting police. Maybe you're doing it in your family. Maybe right now you're at a level at which you can only do it in yourself. Like better self-understanding and self-examination is an anti-racist tool. I have to learn how my body responds when I'm confronted with the discomfort from a person of color, when I'm challenged by diversity or I'm challenged by an idea that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. One thing that we've been talking about, learning about, me personally thinking and learning about is just how important it is for someone's counselor to understand their context, the context that maybe they grew up in or that they live in. Um, obviously, you can't speak as a, a black counselor because I know mm -hmm. you're not. But I wonder mm -hmm. just if you have any thoughts on that and maybe how the, the moments or instances where you've been able to connect with a client because of shared language or shared common ground? Um, I, I feel like I had an, uh, an entryway through my university training, like my undergrad, I, I did a minor in anthropology. And those were my first connections to the reality of those differences um, that challenged my own perceptions. So I grew up Puerto Rican, uh, but we were, were white in Puerto Rico because it's a different racial system. And so I was trying to navigate what it meant to be different or in a contradictory situation growing up in the United States in the South versus what my family taught me that I was through a Puerto Rican lens. So there's a little dissonance there. And I always kind of carried that in discomfort. Those, those anthropology classes um, taught me to question to question the reality, to question what was going on, question those assumptions and those beliefs. And this is outside of a lens of psychology. And I'm, I'm hearing different people's construct of, of race and ethnicity and belonging and history. And, and they were, it was often contentious, but it was so helpful because my, my world opened up, right? Fast forward now into, into this context. This is, a, this is like a psychological, emotional context where we're bringing in all this stuff from the outside world and how it affects our personal system. And so it's been, it's been cool to see those who are open to pass that discomfort and to question their assumptions. I think that's where it begins. I think yeah. people of color, generally speaking, because these systems exist and we're all in them, have had to confront this for far longer. They've had to confront the discomfort and what that causes them to feel how it shapes their experience and relationships a lot longer than, than people who, who haven't, which generally tend to be white. Hmm. 
And so th okay. they're asking fundamentally different sets of questions. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, a little bit of a transition, but I wonder, I know uh, it was just the four year anniversary of the Pulse tragedy in Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you are super plugged into the community in Orlando. And, and I wonder just kind of how, what the, the last couple of weeks have felt like in the city you call home um, between the, the Pulse anniversary um, obviously the pandemic, but then the the response to George Floyd. And I wonder just, just what all of that mixed together has been like. Man, Jamie, like, it feels like the world's on fire. It's just this, it's like almost too much, right? Yeah. Um, how do you create and hold space when everything just feels overwhelming and um, it's not just one circumstance, it's, it is the pandemic and the quarantine and the financial insecurity and the unknown and the, the change in our routines and the interruption to our relationships, right? And then some heavy, some heavy occurrences beyond that societally, political unrest and, and the protests which are bringing up lows of, of like systemic infection. This has been with us a long time. And then like the anniversary of something as horrific as Pulse. Mm. And so I, I think we're just carrying in stride as we can. Um, there is a level I imagine at which we reach fatigue. Mm. And I, that's a consideration that I've been aware of is you can't, I can't carry it all and no one can carry it all. And so I think that that marks a moment of distinction in saying, what, what can I do? How can I show up when everything is heavy sure. how am I taking care of myself and what what do I need would it be helpful for me to step back and to draw some space into what I can contribute I don't think it's unhealthy to disconnect mm -hmm. um, I think I think there have been plenty of people that I'm working with that feel like I don't know what to do and it doesn't feel like enough and so I feel obligation and guilt and I don't know mm -hmm. even what to do with that as the world continues to burn. And so, you know, what is, what is my place? There's just so many questions in there about what's appropriate. I think as a community, everyone's doing the best they can. I wanna give them that, the benefit of that doubt. Is there any advice that you can share? Maybe it's, maybe it's something you've offered. You kind of shared a hypothetical a moment ago, but to people who are feeling overwhelmed, fatigued, guilty, confused, they don't, maybe they don't even know exactly what they're feeling, but they know it's a lot. Um, just any, any thoughts you might have for someone in that place? Uh, first, I would say there's, there's no wrong emotion. I don't think we're always given the opportunity or the tools to really just validate what it is we're feeling when we're feeling it. And to be able to start off with that premise that whatever I'm experiencing, it may not be full reality and it may not be facts, but it is valid. And so if we can start with that compassionate lens in place first, then we'll be able to continue to move and not get stuck in any overwhelming or heavy emotion or in that disempowerment or in that self-criticism or accusation or confusion. Uh, I, I have to remind myself regularly that if I'm gonna continue to do this kind of work, the work of self-examination has to precede that. And I have to be able to, to know what it is I'm experiencing in order to do something with it. Otherwise I become disempowered and I become overwhelmed. And then it's not that I'm useless, but I'm not helpful anymore to anybody, sure. not even myself. Yeah. Um, these are probably questions I asked you last time we spoke. And I, I feel like I, I love to ask every guest throughout the, I guess almost three months now we've been doing these, but what has uh, prioritizing your own personal mental health and self care in your own life? What has that looked like in recent weeks? Uh, a lot of walking in the woods, a lot of being near like flowing water. We, we use these like very, very practical things that I think have um, 
big emotional and spiritual ramifications. The, the disconnect is a choice that I make in order to get recharged and restored. And that looks like getting into my body. It takes on an embodied form uh, because I can get so emotional. So kind of using the Enneagram um, yeah. framework that we've talked about, like I exist primarily in my emotional state. And so I can, and I'm very comfortable there. It's, some, it's somewhere I understand. Four? I'm a four, yeah. I'm a social four. And so what's up for? <laughs> but th that means that I'm, I'm weakest at really taking charge of my emotions and doing something with them. And if I can't activate it somehow, then I'm, I'm just sort of succumbing to my own cycle. So it looks like getting in my body and doing something. It looks like being barefoot in sand. It looks like being in the water. It looks like eating breakfast. Yeah. It's like incredibly um, banal self-care stuff, but yeah. it's really effective. I wonder, I remember, I feel like we were sitting in a board meeting when you talked about the experience of being in your body, how that was something new for you. And I know for you that, or I believe it went back to a health scare, a really challenging time that you went through a couple yeah. of years ago. And I wonder just briefly, if you could kind of talk about what that has meant to you and how that's been helpful. Uh, I, I saw it as an awakening or like a second a second chance because I had been so unkind to my body out of neglect and unknowing, right? Mm -hmm. My ignorance didn't absolve me from actually living in a body, despite the fact that I didn't know how to do it and how, yeah. and that it was a frustrating endeavor. It did give me a deeper level of freedom once I began to like notice this, the corporeal form, right? I live in this thing and if I don't take care of it, I don't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. It was, it was both the charge that needed intention, I needed to do something, but it was also an invitation towards deeper kindness. When I began to pay attention to my body and to bypass some of the intensity of emotion, I actually kind of came into a, a much better balance, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, psychologically, some things started to fall into place. And that, that body awareness was an entry point for me. I think for many people, it starts at their emotions. Maybe they live in their head too much, or maybe they're just too reactive and have no control over that visceral response, and they need to understand what their emotions or their thoughts are doing. So I think different yeah. people have entry points. Mine just happened to be that I didn't know what to do. I was yeah. kind of lost. Um, how, what have relationships looked like, like the value of friendships or connection with other people in recent weeks, sorry, Gracie's walking over the, the wire. <laughs> um, whatever relationships looked like, you kind of cut up. Yeah, like you, talk, you talked about, um, you know, being in the water, being in nature, but I wonder about kind of human interaction or connection. Yeah. How the, Gracie, we're on television. <laughs> um, man, what, wasn't that one of the things that kind of felt challenged during quarantine time in terms of priorities and who we could interact with and who was safe and who wasn't safe. And, and yeah. uh, because of, of my condition, I felt like I needed to pull away a little bit more strongly. And so like telehealth and, and Zoom and Instagram, like these are the ways that I continue to connect. It isn't ideal, but it's what we had. And yeah. so I'm still kind of navigating what it looks like to be around people again with like masks on and yeah. in public. And uh, it's, it's difficult, especially yeah. when I, we, we all get so much out of these interactions and to not be yeah. able to have them is taxing. Yeah. Are you, um, I've become a big fan of FaceTime. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, in the past I would FaceTime my nephews or my mom. Uh, but I feel like I've, I've leaned into that. And again, it's not the same as, you know, getting coffee or a meal with someone, but is that, yeah. have, you, have you been a FaceTimer in recent weeks? Well, in recent weeks, yeah. I think before I kind of hated it. And yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you, you grow accustomed. I think that's a, a change that was necessary is we're, this is what's available to us now and we have to utilize it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, is pro this will probably bring us to the end of our time, but this has felt like an important question in recent weeks, but I wonder, are you hopeful? And, and I mean that sort of big picture, you, you 
you described it as the world being on fire or it feels mm -hmm. like the world is on fire. And I wonder, are you hopeful for change, for positive change that can come from this time? My visceral response is no, absolutely not. Uh, but I'm seeing it through a lens. I heard this, um, do you know Devendra Barnhart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, he's a musician and he was on an, uh, a podcast that I like called On Being and he was reading from one of his favorite books by Pema Chodron, Things Fall Apart, right? And it's, it's sort of her journey and kind of a Buddhist exploration, uh, specifically around hope. And it made, me, it made me think a lot about kind of my constructs of hope, hope as an expectation versus hope as a reality that I can kind of tap into. Yeah. In, a, in an enigmatic sort of way, there's something bigger that I'm hoping about. If I have hope as an expectation that society, it's going to change now, it's going to be fine now, things are going to be good now, then I think I'm setting myself up for something that may not happen in the way that I've constructed. And I think that that's unfair. Um, so the phrase was like, hope is dead, like let hope die, but not in a cynical, nihilistic wow. way but in a surrender to kind of what is. Yeah. What, what is in front of me is what is. And I, I have my lens. I have the stuff that I see and I tend to be negative anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> Only because I'm wanting to deconstruct and to understand more. I think some people live in a very constructive way and they're trying to build structures that can be reliable. Mm. And they perhaps deal with hope in a different way, man. Mm. And so when I say I don't have any hope, it means I'm, I'm putting a far less expectation into what is going to happen, even because of these protests or because of this social upheaval or coronavirus. I just say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's really honest. Um, last but not least, how, how could people connect with you? How could people, uh, if someone's looking for a counselor in Central Florida, where could they go? Stuff like that. Yeah, so um, I'm continuing to see people via telehealth, phone, and then in, and starting in person this week, I started again with masks on inside, which is now Orange County is mandating that everyone wear masks now while in public or in interactions. Yeah. Um, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us at solacecounseling.org uh, or at our phone number, which is on the Internet. That's a thing now. So. Yeah. Well, man, thank you so much. Um, thank yeah. you for for your time. I know, like we touched on, you're 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 counseling today. You're you're seeing people. So thank you for making time in the midst of that. Of course, man. It's always nice. And, uh, thank you for it's your good friendship to see your beautiful and, face. Oh, uh, dude. Likewise, I like four fours unite. <laughs> We're not well, too much. We're not. <laughs> We're just oh, the man. right amount. Well, Dude, I hope I uh, hope to see you in person sometime soon. And uh, love you, man. Enjoy the rest Peace of your love day. You. Thanks, right. man. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, see you, Stefan. Bye. That is Stefan Montessarin. Stefan is with Solace Counseling in Orlando, Florida, basically downtown Orlando, Florida. Stefan works with Aaron and Michelle Moore, who are two other longtime friends of the organization. Stefan is a To Write Love on Her Arms board member for the last couple of years, a great guy to follow. And uh, again, we're grateful for his time. And with that, we are gonna bring on the one and only Propaganda. And I'm gonna look for him, excited to be talking to him on Juneteenth. Here's Prop. My man. Look at this camera. This is terrible. You, <laughs> it Sheesh. looks like a, like a special effect. Sheesh. It's called face juice. Dude, you, it looks <laughs> good. You totally corrected it. You know what I'm saying? The cup, let, me, let me close the... I'm all backlit. This it's, is all unprofessional. You know, you, know, you know your stuff. Hey, man. You know what I'm saying? There we go. There we go. Ah, what so. shirt is that? That's a good shirt. Oh, it's a, for a pod called Worst Year Ever. <laughs> okay. So... That's what all the words are blacked out. It says worst. And then down here it says year and then ever. It's like one of my favorite podcasts. Yeah. It was supposed to just be about the 2020 election. And then it turned out everything else sucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, There's some cold brew. I like Excuse it, man. Me. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you for making time. I know you've been yeah, a busy, busy guy the last few days, last few busy weeks. Busy guy. Um, one thing we talked about, and I might I might fumble through this a little bit. I'll I'll ask for good. some grace. Is that and I, you've you've shared this on Instagram, Twitter. We we talked an hour ago, but you you're not here here being in general. You, you're not just here to teach white people how to think yeah. about racism, yeah. how to process this moment. Yeah. Um, and so I want to really honor that and and not just ask you to teach a largely white <laughs> audience. But I, yeah. hopefully with that, I do want to hear about your experience and, and maybe a place to start just what not only Juneteenth means to you, but but obviously this is in my lifetime, I've, I've never experienced something like this in terms of the momentum and the attention. And so yeah. I wonder what, what is this day today, this year, what does it mean to you? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I got asked a couple times, like, what, like, on, on social media, like, yo, how do you celebrate? What do we, what's the proper way to celebrate Juneteenth? And I was, like, kind of frozen because I was, like, I've never been asked that. And it's never been a holiday. It's just been something that we've celebrated in the Black community. We don't get the day off work. Yeah. So I'm usually just spending the day pissed off that it's not a holiday. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, like, why is this not recognized? You know? And then at some point, if it falls on a weekend, then for me, like, I'll go down to, like, the Crenshaw District. This is in L.A., Lamert Park. There's probably some sort of parade, performances, a couple, like, booths. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe look at some books, visit my grandma. Like, you know, we just do just Black stuff. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And just essentially, just like I said, just be mad that it even has to be a thing. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Sure. Um, so I spend most of the time like that. Uh, but I was like really taken back because I was like, I don't know what to tell you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so so Juneteenth is, is like, it's a little, it's a little, I don't know what the word is, but just it's a little jarring that like more than black people are talking about it, yeah, you know? Yeah. So I'm almost like, I don't, I don't know what to, like I when to say. When like, did it I don't become, know, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know what to tell you. We were freed, like, except for the history to be like, Emancipation Proclamation was 1963. We weren't set free till 1960, or not 1960, 1863. Yeah. We weren't set free until 1865. Mm -hmm. What took two years? Well, the Civil War wasn't over yet. Right. And then at the end of the Civil War, we still wasn't set free because Texas still wanted their last harvest. Right. right? So mm -hmm. even though the law had changed, the war was done, Texas still wanted their crops. Right. Mm -hmm. Until somebody pulled up on a boat and was like, listen, you got to set them free. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, so with the reality of those things, it's it, Juneteenth has always been something special in our black communities. You know what I'm saying? So. It's interesting, obviously, in this next continuum of justice work to see it fall around this time. Yeah. And with all this energy and curiosity around, you know, Black people. I also, uh, we'll probably get to this a little later, but like, Crazy. you're asking me no. what I'm feeling. Hey, get that dog. Crazy. <laughs> hey, stop being racist. Uh, your dog don't want to hear about black history. See, you be raising racist dogs, man. Oh. Just playing. Uh, no. Um, there's this, like, the part of me that it's, like, really enjoy seeing so much, like, diversity in this, this new wave of protest, you know, because um, I hearken back to the, 96, the 92 riots. You know what I mean? I was a child then, but I hearken yeah. back to that. Um, thinking when me thinking that that was like this was going to be the moment that the country changed and then my grandma goes reminds us of the watch riots in the 60s mm -hmm. to be like dang that was 30 years and now this was 30 years you know what i'm saying so just like every 30 years la catching on fire um mm -hmm. thinking about that right uh but seeing like okay all this like 
talk and like street names being changed. Like part of me still has that like folding my arms kind of like, okay, it's cool that you're here. It's cool that you're doing this, but like, you like this song. Are you gonna stick around for the concert? Yeah, like, yeah. This is a long fight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I am done. I've, I've never been the artist. Like if you know propaganda's history, like I don't, I don't accommodate fragility. Like I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't play nice. You yes. know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I'll be gracious. I'll be understanding because we're humans and we all have our own sort of, you can only understand what you understand, but like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to manage your fragility. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, this is what we're talking about. This is what happens. The forefathers of the country were trash. I don't know what to tell you. That's just what happened. You know what I'm saying? They were trash humans. I'm sorry. That's just, what do you, yeah. what do you, racism is real. Like, yeah. I don't, you have privilege. I just, I don't, I, I'm not going to, I'm not gonna play dumb with you, you know. So, so, so there's the part of me that's like, I'm glad that people are now around, and I'm and I'm watching, sort of the clumsiness. Mm. But the clumsiness doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me as long as I know that you're in it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? So if you like me and you, Jamie, we're friends, and I know you believe in causes of justice. I know you believe in it, right? So if you're clumsy in the way that me and you interact that's okay in yeah. the same way that like, I'm not gonna punish my child if I'm teaching her how to ride a bike and she falls, like she yeah. doesn't get grounded over it. No, it's just, it's okay. Like I get it, you wanna, it's okay, right? Yeah. Um, so clumsy is okay to me, right? But, and then it gets to a point to where it's almost comical. Like I just read an article that like, Amazon office in Chicago in celebration for Juneteenth offered their employees chicken and waffles. I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, it's like you have America is has so little practice yeah, in yeah, engaging yeah. positively with the black community that your best thought not send everybody home. Yeah, yeah. Was feed them chicken and waffles. I'm like. You, you have no experience yeah. engaging with black people positively. Like, it's like the biggest company in America. <laughs> you're the biggest company in America and your solution was feed them chicken and waffles. Yeah. When I see that, when I saw that video going around of the actors all like looking in the camera, apologizing for white privilege. And I'm like, what are you, that's not how this works. Yeah. You know how privilege works? It's not. I mean, thanks. Yeah. And just like with Amazon, don't get me wrong, chicken and waffles are delicious. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I get it. At the same time, I'm like, I just, I. Sure. I can't be, I can't be the victim of your oppression and the cure. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, sure. I can't be both here. Yeah. <laughs> uh -uh. Oh, that's so good. I wonder, and I know this is broad, but um, I guess we had you on probably about a month ago, something like that. And I yeah. wonder just to whatever extent you feel like sharing just what the last several weeks, the last month has, has felt like and looked like for you. Yeah, a lot of emotions. Cause within these last month, like I had a birthday. Um, Dude, happy birthday. Thank you, yeah, Gemini. I'm sorry I missed that. How, ma how many are you? How many I are you? I don't talk about it. I'm 40. Um, black don't crack, me too. Who's you older than, who, am I older than you? I don't know, when did you turn 40? January 24th. Okay, where you got me by, I got you by a few months. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh wait, you're younger by a few months. No, 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 I'm 41. I just oh, okay. turned 41. All right. Yeah. Happy so birthday. like, yeah, but you know, it don't crack. You see any grays? Oh, yeah, oh, dude, I'm, sh I'm showing it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, um, my <laughs> um, yeah, we, me and Alma finally had our first fight for the whole quarantine. Wow. Um, the first time, which is like, that's impressive for a married couple that we hadn't fought until June. Um, and I, and it was like, honestly, because like, we were just, you know, when you're on edge, you're like tanks empty, you know what I'm saying? And then finally it snaps, you know what I'm saying? We were doing everything we could to not, you know, blow up on the next white person we saw you feel me because mm -hmm. it's like we understand that that's that's not the 
that's not the solution. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, not blow up at our kids. We're trying to like, we, we've, we've always included our children in our justice work. So they've been a part of protests and stuff like that. Um, yeah. You know, they see us do these lives and, you know, they hear us record Red Couch, so they know, you know. Um, but, yeah, we finally, like, and the way we were arguing was, like, <laughs> our stressors were, like, leaking in to where we were, like, I feel like this issue is systemic. Like, you have a systemic problem. <laughs> it was, it's systemic? Like, that's an interesting choice of words, right? So, anyway. Once we got in, once we got down to it, we were like, okay, yeah, this was, this is a problem as a normal couple would have, you know, but at the same time, like, hey, where did we stop doing our, like, sticking to our schedules that, like, created normalcy? When did we stop, like, have you skipped working out a few days? Have I skipped a few, like, meditations? You know what I'm saying? And, like, yeah. where we, like, sort of lost that, the boundaries we had set for your, ourselves, you know, it just like we're like okay let's go back to like being more disciplined in our boundaries you know mm. um i've seen a couple questions pop up and thank you really? for that because i forgot to mention if if you guys are listening and you have a question for prop uh, you can submit that at the bottom obviously the comments are off because we want to honor him we want to listen but if you have a question we want to get to oh uh, i was get like to, i don't see no yeah like nobody's like Nobody has wow. anything to say, no. Okay, um, yeah, no, got it, anyway. I wonder, what about, I follow you, um, I know you've, you've been part of the protest, you've been in the streets, and then I know mm. you've also talked about the experience of seeing your lyrics and your words shared. <laughs> and, and I just wonder what some of that has been like for you. Man, when I think of like, uh, 2010, 2011 propaganda. Um, I I never had this illusion that I could be a Christian rapper star because I knew what I talked about. You know what I'm saying? And I knew that wasn't where I came from. Christian rap came and found me in California. There was no such thing. You were just yeah. rappers, you know. Um, but as it come and found me, and then I released my first record and I'm talking about Oscar Grant. I'm talking about Trayvon Martin. I'm talking about, you know what I'm saying? My first like uh, nationally distributed record, you know what I mean? That wasn't just like made out the trunk, you know what I'm it saying? It was your clap that got her. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so as that happened, you know, and then the Precious Puritan song came on and like all of a sudden I got added, propaganda got added to the naughty list, you know? Um, where I'm friends with everybody, but he a little too, he's too political, you know? Yeah. Um, and how much, like, how many things I either got uninvited to or never invited to, you mm. know, within the Christian spaces, you know, in the, in the general market of hip hop, like, no one knew the difference, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, but I got relegated to this other table, the mm. unsafe room, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, PG-13 Christian? Yeah, totally. You know what I'm saying? Uh, pulled off Lifeway. Like, they didn't carry my book, my, my uh, albums. You know what I'm saying? Like, stuff like that. So when I think of 10 years of that, and then now being like, you know what, though? I stood to my guns. I stood my ground. I knew what the right side of history was. And I said what I said. Seeing stuff come back in this season has been like, man, it was like, it's cool to see to that it was all worth it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I knew it was worth it, but it's cool to see it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because of all, I'm telling you like entire blogs, like co like conferences, freaking Q and A sessions about the problem of hip hop and propaganda, you know what I'm saying? And just yeah. like, like I, what passes I ain't never met, like dedicating entire like articles, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm just like, about stuff that's historically accurate, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And just and theologically true, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, you know, so just, it's been amazing to see, like, now nah, fools have been listening and they've been able to go back. Like, I have a track record. You see it, I'm seeing some pastors, like, scramble into their, like, archives to try to find something years back to say that they've been saying this. Yeah, And yeah. some of them are like, some of them can't find it, 
You know yeah. what I'm saying? And then some of them do, and you post it, and it's so disingenuous. You think we can't tell that's what you're doing, that you're just sure. trying to go find something. You feel me? Like, I'm like, yeah. I got... I got a catalog, fam. This is yeah. who I am and who I always been. I don't need to pivot. I don't need yeah. to start talking about, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's been cool. Um, I mentioned this when we talked on the phone a little while ago. Uh, kind of, I love that you you insist on being a whole person. Yes. So, so being not just a black leader, not just someone who has thoughts on injustice or racism but you like coffee and you're a girl dad and you're a husband mm -hmm. um and i remember you you tweeted that you had added four thousand followers um i assume right after the murder of george floyd and you yes you tweeted 10 10 things about you and i wonder yeah. if you could just talk about why that matters to you and, and maybe what that means to you because at the end of the day if we're gonna boil down the specificity of anti-black sentiment and racism specifically towards black people in America, it is still the idea of chattel in the sense that black life is functional. It's utility, right? You, you're valuable to the point that you give me something, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's at the core of white supremacy, that's what's happening. You you are functional for me, yeah. right? So when they were when you're able to commodify and make a function out of the entire body of the black person, that's slavery, right? Yeah. When I can relegate you to the growth of my profits, mm. that's sharecropping, that's mass incarceration. And if that's the case, if you are just a utility for me, of course I don't want to live next to you. You just like who lives, who lives with their cows? Yeah. You know yeah. lives with their cows? They have the space over there. Yeah. So that's redlining. You put them in that community. What segregation mm -hmm. is because you're just a, you are a function, right? Yeah. So if someone goes, oh crap, I'm in this. I need to listen to black voices. I'm still just a utility to you. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So the point for me is like, I'm jumping up a conversation and go, okay, it's good that you're listening, but you're still just treating me like a utility. Yeah. I'm still just a, I'm still just a, a milk cow. Yeah. And I need you to understand I'm a person. What, right? what kind of response did you see when you shared those 10 things? Some humor, cause some of them were funny. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also Lact saw- Lactose other, intolerant. Yes, you know, and then, which is true, you know, cause again, I'm a full human, you know. And I saw other black leaders do the same to be like, you know what? I'm gonna do that too. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, cool. Yeah, you know, and ultimately, uh, yeah, and, 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 and I saw a few light bulbs turn on to be like, yo, actually, yeah, I was just thinking of you as an idea or a resource. Yeah, almost like you're a class people can take. Yes, you know what I'm saying? Again, it's, it's, it is the psychological understanding of supremacy, which mm. says that at, at the subconscious level, everyone else is a function for my good. Yeah. You are utility for me, right? Mm. So, yeah. it, you, I mean, you could apply that to uh, yeah. immigration, apply that to like Latin American immigration. It's like, when even even the argument for being just to Latin American immigrants, the argument is, well, who's going to pick our strawberries? Mm. Who's going to pick our fruit? You're still seeing these people mm. as just a utility. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So even even in you trying to advocate, I'm still they're still just a utility to you. You yeah. know, so like I wanted to push back at that. You know? Yeah. Um, I wonder, and I, I asked you this last time, I asked Stefan yeah. a few minutes ago, um, what has prioritizing your own mental health, your own self-care, what has that looked like over the last month? Uh, it's, look, it's looked like saying no, really. It's looked like not taking every, not answering DMs, not taking every interview request, um, 
And when I do take them being very particular about my time, how yeah. long I have, when I'm willing to do it, what time of the day I'm willing to do it, and how much I'll give you, what I'm willing to talk about, what I'm not. Sure. It's just protecting all of those things um, have been really like, has been, has, this was the first time in this practice of justice, this, this, this chapter was the first chapter I was aware enough to do that, mm. you know, um, to just not, and some of it came out of cynicism to be like, okay, so you want me to tell you what I told you three years ago? You want me to tell you what my father told you in the 60s? You want me to tell you what you should already know, what you can Google, what I've already done interviews on, what yeah. is already on my YouTube? You want a personal message of yeah. something you should already know? Nah. So there's a part of it that was cynical. And then there was a part of it that's saying, again, realizing why it was frustrating me so much. It was what I was saying, where it's like, you still see me, you still see me as a product, mm. you know? And mm. I know I'm an artist, you can't be silly, I'm an artist, I sell cups and coffee. I know that I'm selling a product. I know the brand propaganda is a musician. I get it. In that sense, yeah, I'm a product, but that's an agreed social. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? But when you asking me about my blackness, and you need me to, I'm like, I can't, I can't bottle and package that. You know, yeah. So for me, soul care and and like mental health care has been like having good, clear boundaries. Like what we would say in you know in the streets, like having a code. Like this is my code. I yeah. don't break the code. I have one in business. I have, there are, there are deal. I have business deal breakers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like where I'm like I'm not. That's against my code. I don't care how much you pay me. Mm. You know. Um, or I don't. Or that's too little. I don't care how much I like you. Yeah. You're paying me under my worth. Yeah. We can still be friends, but I have a code. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh and I have the freedom to obey it and not obey it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh but yeah, so for me that it's been that. It's been setting really good boundaries. What's on the other side of those boundaries, like in terms of um how how have you been spending that time that, that helps you feel alive or helps you recharge? Um Good conversations with friends, good coffee, unplugging. I've been burning uh, ESPN 30 for 30s, you know, uh, enjoying the like the Vic and the Lance one. And yeah, yeah and the, I just we watched had the, the, the last the dance for a while. Movie. Yeah, we had the last dance. You know what I'm saying? All the stuff, all the brainless stuff, you know, like not compromising when it comes to like my meals, like, you know, um, making really good meals. Like mm. now that I'm not buying flights, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, I could yeah. buy, I could buy the high end salmons. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've been like, we've been cooking really good meals, and I'm like, dude, I'm not gonna, I am not going to settle for anything less than the best possible meal. You know, dude, that's so best good. possible drink. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I do want to, I want to honor these folks. I want to at least take one question. Yeah, because I got to go gonna break, here. I'm going to break the rule and ask you to maybe teach us for a moment. Do you, is this something you could speak to or that What's you the process about? to make this a national holiday and how many days should it be? Well, that's great. Uh, I don't know the process of making a holiday national. I, I have no idea. You know, I mean, I, I assume it's a... I've, I, I've seen a petition... Thing. There's a petition yeah. floating around. I mean, I guess, like, I don't know. You know what I mean? I think uh, this is one of those Googleable ones. Yeah, you know, and uh, how many days it should be? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, that, I mean, I'm honest with you. Like, I just, I don't know, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the practice should be because, again, it's never, never been, no one ever, no one's ever wanted to care or be yeah, invited. Yeah. So we just kind of like figured it out ourselves. You go to your grandma's house, you talk about Dr. King, you know what I'm saying? You look at, you know, old movies, you know what I'm saying? And you go to the local like African flea market, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And you just celebrate blackness. I don't like, I don't know what to tell you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't get that one to go away. So it's going to stay up. But okay. I want, I know you got to be somewhere in five minutes. I'm trying to. Yeah. What's the next one? Ghosts in the Machine. No, this one's from me. 
Um, oh. I asked Stefan, I've been asking people the last few weeks, in the, in the midst of all of this, this moment in history, I wonder, are you hopeful? Um, such a complex word, right? Yeah. I think I'm hopeful in the... It's easier I'm hopeful to... in a particular, in a few particular things. It's easy to put it on a shirt. It's another yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, to... yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, there are specific things that I am hopeful in. I'm hopeful in the youth. I love how, like, they just don't got time no more. Like, they're like, we're not playing games with y'all. I'm not playing patty cake. We in the streets. We're going to stay in these streets. I don't care how long it takes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so I'm hopeful for that. I'm hopeful in the sense that, like, they checking their parents, checking their grandparents. Mm -hmm. Taylor Anybody... Swift's on board. Taylor Swift. Comrade Smith. You feel me? Right? <laughs> you know, they not like that. I'm hopeful because, like, the kids ain't playing games. And I'm hopeful in the kids. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's been super dope. Um, I'm tempered in having the wisdom of of a little more years on me to be like, okay, I know how history works. History doesn't turn on a dime. Mm. There's multiple steps. I know that this is a step in it. Um, but I'm also like in the sense of like, I'm the type that has a, you know, like, we can have an we can have a prophetic imagination. All of our institutions are made up. Mm. Like the, the, we made them up. Like you know what yeah. I'm saying? They don't exist in nature. The left wing and right wing. That's from the French Revolution, and it was only called the left because the worker class sat on the left side of the room. It's made up. Like they're not. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. We made it up. Sure. You know, Even like, like the police, I, right? We made it up. The police yeah. is a made up. I'm doing a whole pod. Like, it's called Behind the Police. It's a four-part series. We made it up, you know? And if we made it up, then we can make it up again. We can yeah. make it better. Like, if that's, yeah. if that's what I'm hopeful in, it's just like, let me just, like, I w wish I could run across the country and be like, all of your institutions are imaginary. We yeah. made them up. We made them up. They don't have to be this way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I want to let you go. I want to honor your time. But thank you so much, man. Thank you for thank your you. voice and your friendship. Appreciate you. Good. Yeah, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Love you, man. All right, guys. Love y'all. Take care. See ya. Deuces. Oh, uh, that was propaganda. If you don't already, please follow propaganda. He is at prop hip hop uh, check out his red couch podcast check out the other podcast that he's a part of that he just mentioned uh, and then just to to bring it all back uh, please visit our site we have mental health re resources created um, by and for the black community we're excited to share those we have another extensive list for white people who want to learn about and practice anti-racism there are a couple other blog posts that have gone up in recent days that we're really proud of. And last but not least, next week, next Thursday, I believe it's 4 p.m. Eastern, we will have a special live for Pride Month. And so we're still working out the details, but uh, next Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern, special live celebrating this Pride Month. And uh, we will certainly keep you informed on that. Uh, you guys, please stay safe, stay healthy. Happy Juneteenth. If you need to learn more about that, you can. Uh, as Prop said, it's okay to fumble through it. It's okay to learn. And it's a great time. Millions of us, myself included, we're, we're learning a lot right now. So thank you to Stefan and Prop for joining us. Thank you to you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And uh, you guys take care. We'll see you next week. Bye.